In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain's Report, we are continuing our series in the book of 1 Samuel. And you may recall that yesterday one of the things that we were talking about is that Nahash and the Ammonites, they have all congregated together and they are threatening to take over a certain region in Israel and the people in that region of Israel are so scared and so terrified of these guys, they even consider gouging out their own eye in order to avoid being taken over by these people. They say, you know what, we'll be your slaves, just don't kill us. And they say, okay, but to show us that you're sincere, you've got to gouge out everybody's eye. And they contemplate doing it. That's how terrified they are of these guys. And then Saul comes out and goes, uh, no, he gets very angry. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. And he's very angry at these people. And he even goes out and uh, cuts his own oxen in pieces. And he says, any man that isn't willing to fight, this same thing is going to be done to his oxen. So he's using a metaphor there, but he sends a very strong message. He gathers up all the people. The language that the Bible uses is that the people are united as one person. In other words, they have one mind. They are ready to fight this guy. And the way that the scripture describes it in the following verses is that they destroyed the Ammonites so thoroughly and divided them so sorely that there was not even two of them left together. So in other words, they just went through in waves and destroyed the entirety of the Ammonite army to where there aren't even two guys standing next to one another. So this was, by all measures, an absolutely crushing victory by Saul and the Israelites. And what I find really interesting is this next little episode that happens directly after that battle, where there's some contention amongst the people that have just fought the battle, you can see this in 1 Samuel 11, verses 12 through 13, where it says, Then the people said to Samuel, Who is he that, shall, that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men, that we may put them to death. But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished deliverance in Israel. Remember all those worthless men? We did a chaplain's report on it, I think, two or three days ago. And you may recall that in this particular passage, what was being bantered about was th the Saul guy that God has chosen for king. We don't know if he's really got it or not. I don't think that he should be king. Maybe God made a mistake. Maybe this isn't really the person that should be leading us. And so there's quite a bit of naysayers and they don't offer the king any, any presents. They don't celebrate with him that the king has now been coronated. Basically, they just kind of are apathetic and are like, you know what, whatever, we don't really want anything to do with you. Which is also hilarious because these are probably at least some of the same people that were begging God for a king. And when he finally did give him one, they're like, really, that guy, that, that's who he picked? So the hilarious thing is that it's probably the same group of people. And they're just dissatisfied. They don't really want to follow Saul. And the reaction from the people, once Saul has accomplished, this is his first big accomplishment as Israel's king, his first win in a battlefield, all of that. Their reaction is, yeah, who were all those people that were saying that Saul's not the real deal? He's not really got it. Really, Saul, this is going to be the guy that's ruling over us? I think not. Where are all those folks now? Let's go out and let's take them down. Now, you have to understand in the context of what's going on here. First of all, Israel is a people that is not accustomed to having a king, but they knew what other countries did when they did have a king. That's why they ask for a king. When other countries, especially in this time, in this region of the world, if there were people within the kingdom that doubted the king or were seen as malcontents or rebels, it was not uncommon for the king to take part of his army and just go wipe those people out. 
That was a very common practice amongst other kingdoms in this region and in this time period. But this is a point where Saul comes to a crossroad. Saul has to decide, what kind of leader am I going to be? Am I going to be like every other king, or am I going to be God's king? Now granted, I hate to harp on this because I know we've talked about this a lot, I understand that Saul goes from hero to villain. I understand that later in the scripture, Saul becomes a person that very clearly decides, I'm going to be my kind of king. I'm going to follow the practices of the kings in the surrounding areas by taking out any rebels, any malcontents, any people that aren't happy with the way that I'm doing things. Anything that might be a threat to my power, I will destroy them. Saul does make that decision later with David. But right here, right now, after his first act as king, you got to imagine that the guy is riding on a contact high. I mean, he just won the battle, pretty much the entire kingdom is on board with him now, and they see, okay, yeah, this guy is the real deal. He can lead God's people. For somebody in this context, for somebody that has been aware of the things that go on in other countries, it would be not justified, but at least understandable, that Saul would want to go out and destroy the enemies that are doing this that are bashing him or had bashed him in the past, even if they're not doing so anymore. This is his second opportunity to get rid of all the naysayers. You remember the first, when they originally saw it, Saul basically just shrugs it off. It says, the worthless men, and again, that's the Bible's words, not mine. The worthless men said this, and they they were basically throwing shade at Saul. Saul does nothing. Saul ignores it. The, The word that the Bible says is that Saul... And and basically that Saul kept silent or Saul said nothing. I don't remember exactly how it it worded it, but that's the indication the Bible makes a point to point out that Saul's reaction was essentially nothing. So that was opportunity number one. Now he's come to opportunity number two where he has the ability to go hard and fast and to take out everybody that doesn't think he should be king. And Saul's reaction is no, I'm not going to do it. See, and it's even more tempting now because he has the authority, has the backing of the people. It wouldn't just be something that could be at least viewed as a vanity, even though it would be. Saul still decides not to do it. Still decides it's not worth it, that a personal attack against him, personal animus and a personal vendetta is not fitting the role of God's king. And he's right. I think that when it comes to the nation being united, there are really two methods that Saul could have gone about with this. Get rid of everybody that wasn't on board, get rid of everyone that wasn't united, or do things God's way, merciful, deciding that, you know, maybe there's some even some value into that criticism. You see, we may not be kings today, You and I definitely aren't. We don't have that kind of power. We can't just kill people that we don't like. But I think right now, today in America, the unfriend culture and the cancel culture that wants to get everybody out of their life, I don't know how many Facebook posts and Twitter uh, memes and whatever that I've seen that are like, just get all the toxic people out of your life. Get all the people that are saying anything bad about you, that are critical of you in any way, essentially. Just get those people out of your life. What are you doing here? Seriously, if you're going to get rid of everyone that is critical of you, that is giving you a hard time, how are you ever going to grow? If you're only going to surround yourself with yes men and people that either flatter you or are apathetic towards you, you're not going to have any real friends. And I know I sound a little bit like an after school special at this point, but in my opinion, The mark of a good friend is one that feels comfortable enough to disagree with you or to argue with you. Because once they've done that, it A, means that they feel comfortable enough around you, they've been around you long enough to know that you're not the kind of person that's going to fly off the handle at them for doing that. And and B, I think that 
the reason that that's really an indication of what a true friend is, is they care more about you as a person, whether it's something to do with your morality, a personal failing of yours. They care enough about you to want you to improve, even if it means you don't like them for a few minutes or for a short time, or even, you know, possibly for a long time. That says a lot about the kind of friends that you are, and I think that we have a a tendency and a desire to eliminate anybody from our lives, even if we can't kill them, to just get everybody out of our life that is critical of us in any way because it makes us uncomfortable. Look, some of my best friends are some of the people that are most critical of me. If you've ever watched our show, back in the day when Laura Clark was on there, back then she was Laura Glidewell, if you've ever seen her and me interact, I mean, yeah, we agree on a lot of things, but sometimes she'll bust my chops on things, and that's fine. That's one of the reasons she is one of my best friends is because she's not afraid to tell me when she thinks I'm wrong. What we can't do is immunize ourselves to all criticism, and Saul had the opportunity to do that here and said no. That says a lot about his character. Nobody would have thought twice. Nobody would have held a grudge against him in the kingdom. Well, partly because they'd be afraid that he'd kill them, but also because... Nobody would have thought twice for a king living in that era around the culture that he was, seeing people that were naysayers that didn't want to jump on board with him leading and taking out all the rebels. And yet Saul doesn't do it. And unfortunately, the kings of Israel and Judah after this, for generations to come, are going to do exactly that. That when a prophet of God comes and tells them that they're wrong, they just kill the prophets. When anybody really says anything negative, they go after that person. Saul's not that way, and young Saul, the Saul that we see here, is a person definitely after God's own heart, at least to a degree. Maybe not to the level that David was, but he's certainly somebody that understands that mercy is a valuable, valuable quality to have in a king. And also that with that humility comes the willingness to have criticism lobbed against you and, and either let it roll off your back if it's baseless or to take it to heart if it's not. And when it comes to us today, it would do us a world of good to remember that no human is above reproach. None of us are without sin. None of us are without flaws. And so we have to be humble enough to accept that and remember that if there's somebody that's criticizing us, if there's somebody that is, you know, treating us poorly, yeah, maybe that's a them problem. Or maybe it's an us problem. And even if it is a them problem, even if they're in the wrong, that doesn't mean we should just cut that person out of our life. The cancel culture has been something that is so antithetical to the way that God expects us to live. When Jesus teaches us to love our enemies, I don't think he meant love them from a distance, love them from arm's length, love them, but ne you know, never really actually interact with them or talk to them or have a conversation with them and just tune them out every time they say something negative. Yeah, that, that's not what Jesus taught, and, and Saul's kind of modeling that for us right here in this passage. If we want to be like young Saul here, then we have to be willing to take the criticism, and, and whether it's based in something legitimate or it's something like this that is completely baseless. We can't be so thin-skinned that we allow it to drive everyone that disagrees with us out of our lives. Stay the course, friends. So now they have this fancy new technology where you click on one of these boxes and it takes you to another one of my videos. Hopefully it works a lot better than the Obamacare website or the DNC's Iowa caucus app. Gotta love that big government central planning.